So our next uh, presentation is uh, on a fairly similar topic, increasing accuracy of genomic predictions from SNP chips to sequence data. And it is presented by Dr. Daniela Lorenko of the University of Georgia. And she is an assistant professor in animal breeding and genetics at the University of Georgia. She was born and raised in Brazil where she earned her MS and PhD degrees in animal breeding and genetics from Marengo State University. Daniela has been working in this field since 2004, has published over 300 scientific papers and proceedings, including over 90 referee journal publications. The research is focused on improving livestock production using genomic information, developing methods for genetic evaluation, and addressing issues related to the implementation of genomic selection in beef and dairy cattle, poultry, swine, and fish. She's been involved in the implementation of single-step genetic genomic evaluation for some of the American and Canadian beef cattle associations, and has also been actively working with several U.S. and international breeding companies. So, um, uh, let me see if I can, uh, okay, I can do it. You have it, Daniela? Yeah, I do have it. Okay. Very good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So thanks, Mark, for giving me the opportunity to talk today. And I would like to thank everybody that is still uh, connected to this conference. So I know it's pretty late in some parts of the country and in other countries. But anyways, I'm very happy to be here today and talk a little bit about my experience on using regular SNP chips and also sequence data for genomic prediction. And I will try to keep this talk really simple. And there are three reasons for that. One reason is today's Friday. The second reason is that I'm the last speaker in the last uh, day of the conference. And the third reason is that we don't have a barbecue reception, so you can feel the pressure that is on me, right? So, okay. Um, we started using genomic tests back in 2009. So last year we celebrated 10 years of the implementation of genomic evaluation, which is just to use DNA information to help us to um, identify the best animals. So if you think that this idea is quite new, I need to tell you that it's not new. And I always like to show this. So this paper here shows that in 1983, two guys uh, said that we could use DNA information to construct genetic relationships, to do parentage determination, and to identify genes or QTLs, or quantitative trait loci. So they told us that DNA information could help us in animal breeding and also plant breeding. But then uh, what kind of genomic information are we using? Uh, we all know that we use SNPs, so SNPs are just changes in the letters in the DNA. And since the SNPs were first reported, and this was in the first draft of the Human Genome Project, the SNPs, they became the bread and butter of DNA sequence variation. So they're highly used in animals, in plants, and also in humans. So if we think about animals, so if we think about like livestock animals, if we think about poultry, if we think about uh, aquaculture species, so how many SNPs are we looking at? So we are looking uh, at about like, uh, here, yeah, we are looking at about like from 3 million to 8, uh, for, for 3,000, sorry, to 800,000 SNPs. And how do we do that? So we need to collect a sample. So we collect a blood sample or hair sample or tissue sample. We send this sample to the breed association. The breed association is, sending, is going to send this sample to the lab. So in the lab, the technicians are going to extract DNA and they run the DNA into this SNP chip here. And in this SNP chip uh, that I'm showing here, we can run 24 samples at the same time. And then after the, we run the DNA into those, uh, those SNP chips, those SNP chips need to be scanned in uh, some uh, machines here. So we have a scanner that's going to read the genotypes for each SNP. And what is interesting here is that um, if we have heard about 23andMe or Ancestry, so they do genetic tests for humans, and the, the, the idea behind this genetic test is exactly the same idea behind the genomic test that we do for animals. The only difference here is that uh, the SNPs are species specific. So for animals, we have certain SNPs. For humans, we have different SNPs. So the SNP chip is different, but the idea behind it is quite similar. 
So once we have the results from the, the, the lab, so we have the genotypes for the animals, what do we do with those genotypes? So the results from the genomic test. We all know that we just include this information, so we include genomic information in our evaluation system. So we have pedigree performance, and also we have progeny performance, so we include this genomic information. And then we have what we call genomic enhanced EPDs or genomic EPDs. And we all know that genomics is an extra piece of information that helps us to increase accuracy of EPDs, right? And because this uh, increasing accuracy is so considerable, genomic tests, they were uh, adopted by pretty much all livestock species and aquaculture and poultry species. So, uh, and because of that, the number of tests that we have right now can be quite considerable. So if we look here at um, like farm raised fish population, so they may have about from 2000 to 10,000 genotyped fish. If we look at uh, chicken populations or pig populations, we may see some uh, companies that have about 50,000 uh, animals genotyped per line. If we think about sheep populations, we may see populations, especially if we have like multi-breed populations, we can have like over 100,000 genotyped animals. And here in the US for uh, jerseys, they have over 460,000 genotyped animals. And if we think about beef cattle, uh, the largest population genotyped is uh, Angus. So in this case, they have almost 800,000 genotyped animals in the database. But it's still, the uh, population with the largest number of genotypes is Holstein. So they have about 3.4 million genotyped animals. So we can see a quite considerable number of genomic tests for livestock animals, for poultry, and for aquaculture. But then what do we gain by adding these genomic tests? So here, um, just to, to remind you that those, geno the, those numbers are mainly based on uh, regular SNP chips, right? So here in this example, I have the gain in accuracy by using genomic information. And this is for Angus. So we have here the gain for birth weight, winning weight, and post winning gain. So in blue, we have the accuracy when we did not use genomic information. So this is just based on traditional evaluations before genomics. And then in green, we have here genomic evaluation. So this is for a single step GBLUB in 2014, when we had about 52,000 genotyped animals. And then in golden, we can see here um, the accuracy when we used about 335,000 genotyped animals. And this was back in 2017. So if we compare the accuracy, like from the traditional evaluation, and when we use about 52,000 genotyped animals, we saw an increasing accuracy of 25%. But then when we added more genotyped animals, like we had 335,000 genotyped animals in the system, we saw an increasing accuracy of 36%. So we saw a considerable increase in accuracy. And why is that? So we are going to see increasing accuracy when the genomic information is non-redundant in the system. So if this information is not giving exactly the same information as the other source of information that are in the system. So just to illustrate what I'm talking about. So let's say that we have a bull with a lot of progeny records. So, and the accuracy of this bull is 0.99. So if we genotype this bull, we are not going to gain in accuracy. We're not going to see an increase in accuracy because the, um, the EPDs are accurate enough. But then if we genotype a bull that has no progeny with records at all, in this case, we are going to see a considerable increase in accuracy. And this is because genomics is non-redundant with the other pieces of information that are in the system. So in this case, genomics is acting exactly like as we are adding uh, progeny records. And I wanna show you here the equivalence between doing a genomic test and uh, the number of progeny. So if we think, if we genotype a bull, and then um, the gain that we can have in accuracy is the same as if we add 27 progeny with records for winning weight. But then for other traits like uh, mature height, the gain in accuracy may be equivalent to adding nine progeny with records. So, and this uh, progeny equivalent is actually dependent on uh, heritability of the trait. So if the trait has a high heritability, 
uh, the equivalent is lower. If the trait has low heritability, the progeny equivalent will be higher. So I just want to show you here a kind of extreme example. So uh, in Holstein's, uh, if we genotype a bull uh, for, and then we evaluate a trait uh, that is daughter pregnancy rate, and this trait has very low heritability, heritability is 0.04. So this um, genotyping an animal for uh, this trait is equivalent to adding 131 uh, daughters with, pro with records in this case. So, Genotyping is the same as adding progeny records for 131 progeny. So we can see uh, that this is pretty considerable. So we know that using the regular genomic test, we are doing a very good job already. And if you ask my opinion about that, I think uh, genomics is actually the best thing that was invented since sliced bread. So no question about that, right? But then the question here is, so, okay, we see that we can increase accuracy. And then what do we gain by increasing accuracy? So to answer this question, uh, we can just look at the Breeders' equation here. So R here is the accuracy and L is the generation interval. So another thing that genomics uh, can do for us is to help us to better identify the best animals earlier in life. So in this case, we are reducing generation interval. So when we increase accuracy, which is R, and we reduce generation interval, we are going to see an increase in accuracy here. So this is what we gain by um, adding genomic information, right? And then because we started using genomic tests like uh, some time ago, uh, we do have some examples to show what happened with genetic gain since we started using genomic information. And uh, earlier today, we saw John uh, Genol, he showed some uh, trends for beef cattle after um, genomic testing started being used. And then today I brought here two examples that are not in beef cattle. So the first example is in dairy cattle. So some uh, researchers from the USDA and also from, from some research institute in Mexico, uh, they showed that, so what they did, they uh, evaluated for US holdings. So uh, the genomic evaluation started being used for US holdings in about like 2009. So in 2015, they evaluated the gain after genomics was implemented. So what they saw here was a gain. Uh, so the genetic, uh, they saw that the genetic gain increased uh, from like 50% to 100% for yield traits. And for traits with low heritability, like fertility, this gain uh, was like from three to four fold. So we could see a considerable increase in genetic gain uh, for the dairy populations. And another example that I wanna show here is from the pig improvement company. So from PIC, I asked my colleagues from PIC to draw this graph for me. So here we have the graph for genetic trend. Uh, in the y-axis, we have some selection index that they use to select the animals. In the y-axis, we have birth, year, and month. So it starts here from January 2006, and it goes up to May 2019. So here, uh, this red line here shows the trend. So we can see that genetics is improving, so it's going up. And then uh, the blue vertical line here shows when uh, genomics started being used. So here, um, when they started using single step genomic book for genomic evaluations, and this was at the end of 2030. So if genomics had no impact at all, we would see this red line just following this gray line here. But what we actually saw was that this red line shifted up so this tells us that uh, we have an increase in genetic gain. So this tells us that genomics is actually increasing the genetic gain. So if genomics had no impact, the average for selection index would be about like 70. But then since genomic uh, started being used and it has an impact, uh, we saw here a twofold increase in genetic gain. So this is uh, the benefit that we can see by using genomic information. So um, we can see here that we had a, an increase in genetic gain, but then some people may look at this graph and just say, oh, okay, so uh, some of this gain may not be due to genomics. And actually I was asked about that already. So I went back to my colleagues and I asked them, so can you try to identify the percentage of this change that was due to genomics? 
And then they told me, okay, uh, about 95% of this change was due to genomics. So this is because there was an increasing accuracy and a decreasing generation interval. And if we are talking about increasing accuracy, what do we need to do? So we need to, um, this accuracy is going to depend on the number of genotyped animals. So we need to have a lot of genotyped animals. It depends on the number of uh, performance records that we have in the system. It depends on the heritability of the trait. It depends also on how informative the genomic test is. And we've been using a genomic test that has about 50,000 SNPs in beef cattle, but it, it can range, so it has a range. It can be like less than that, a little bit more than that. But on average, let's say about 50,000 SNPs. But then the question is, so is this the genomic test informative enough? Well, we actually don't know. We have an idea. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that later. Okay, another question that we have is, do we have enough SNPs in the test? And also, extra question, are we looking at the right SNPs? Well, uh, just to, to talk a little bit more about this last question here, if we are looking at the right SNPs. So just to illustrate this idea. So the early developed SNP chips, they actually um, had about 70% of the SNPs that could be informative over uh, like across breeds. So uh, the first 50,000 SNP chip that was developed, so it had 54,000 SNPs. And then if we use this SNP, so this SNP was developed based on beef and dairy breeds. So if we use this SNP chip in Angus, uh, we would see only 38,000 SNPs that were informative enough. So the remainder of these SNPs we had to throw away from the evaluation. And this is true also for pigs and for chickens. So in chickens also like from the 54,000 SNP chip, uh, we could use about 39,000 SNPs. So because of that, and also because of other uh, key points, we decided to try to, to use more SNPs, right? So instead of using uh, 50,000 SNPs, what about uh, looking at uh, all SNPs in the DNA, try to find all SNPs. So to do that, we need to sequence the animals. And when we sequence, sequence the animals, we may be able to find like from 30 million to 60 million or maybe 100 million SNPs, right? And just to remember that uh, in the DNA, in the bovine DNA, there are about uh, 3 billion base pairs. So from 3 billion, uh, at least 30 million are SNPs. And to understand why or how this is, uh, sequence information can help us, or if this is going to help us to increase accuracy, we need to remember a key point here. So the point that we need to remember is that the SNPs, they are just trying to capture information about genes. So, and what kind of information? One, inf one, source, of one source of information, sorry, is a uh, relationship. So SNPs are just trying to capture relationships at the gene level. So just to understand it better, um, I got a picture here from Jared Decker from University of Missouri. So in this picture, we have a sire and it's maternal and paternal grandsire. So um, it's expected that this animal shares 25% of its uh, DNA with the paternal and with the maternal grandsire. And this information is the information that we use in the regular evaluation, the no, when we do not use genomic information. But then let's go to the next level where we have genomic tests. So we have information from SNP chips, right? Okay. So in this case, we genotype the animal and its uh, grandsires, and we see that this animal shares 15% of its DNA with the maternal grandsire and 25% of the DNA with the paternal grandsire. So in this case, we have what we call the observed relationship. So we actually have the proportion of the 50,000 SNP chips that are shared um, between the animal and its maternal grandsire and the animal and the paternal grandsire. Okay, so let's go now to the third level. So the third level would be to use sequence data. And what is the idea behind it? What's the hypothesis here? Is that with sequence data, we may find SNPs that give more information about genes. And these may be true if those SNPs, they are close enough to genes or if they are really giving us information about the genes. And just to illustrate what I'm talking about, so let's say that we have a gene re, uh, here represented by this uh, green point here. Okay, so let's say we use 50,000 SNPs 
And then this is what we may have. So we may have SNPs that are close enough to the gene. So those SNPs are going to give us information about the gene, right? So we may have good accuracy here. But let's say that we just uh, sequence we have sequence information, we have information from about 30 million SNPs. So in this case, we can see uh, that the SNPs, they are covering larger areas of the DNA, and we have SNPs here that are even closer to the gene. So if those SNPs that are closer to the genes, they are giving us uh, extra information, so information that is non-redundant with the information that is already given by the 50,000 SNPs, we may be able to see an increase in accuracy. However, if the, the orange SNPs and the blue SNPs, they are giving exactly the same information, again, inaccuracy is unlikely. So in this case, uh, we pretty much are not going to see an increase in accuracy. So it depends on how non-redundant this information is going to be in our evaluation system. And we know that sequencing is becoming uh, cheap. But still, what we see is that, in, uh, and also we, we heard from the previous talk, that we just sequence a small proportion of the animals right now, and then what we do, we impute this sequence information to the, um, all the genotyped animals. So we have genotyped animals with regular SNP chips, we sequence just a portion of them, and then we impute to the other animals that are genotyped. So it's like just filling the gaps, right? And then, um, there is a paper here, a study published by some colleagues from PIC and also from the Roslyn Institute, where, uh, so they had some big populations, so several lines, and then uh, in those lines, they had genotypes like regular uh, snake chip for about 18,000 to 107,000 pigs. So what they did, they sequenced about 2% of the animals in each population, and then they imputed to, uh, 20 million to 30 million SNPs, and they imputed to all those almost 100,000 or a little bit over 100,000 animals. And the imputation accuracy that they uh, obtained here was uh, like from 94% to 98%. So this is, this is quite good, and it tells us that we can have a massive amount of uh, sequence information um, in a cheap way and also in an accurate way. And then last year, uh, at the end of last year, we joined Roslyn Institute and also PIC in this project. So the objective uh, for us is to try to use single step GBLUB in this case, and then try to see if we can have a gain in accuracy when we include those uh, se sequence SNPs in the evaluation. And this is mainly for uh, each line. And then another objective is to try to see how uh, or if we can have like more accurate multi-breed evaluations when we use this sequence information. And another thing that we are going to investigate also is the persistency of accuracy over generations. So if uh, Having information from sequence data will help us to get more persistent uh, genomic evaluations. And then we are going to do that uh, for several lines. Actually, we started doing that, but I don't have uh, results to show here today. So um, we, we got this data like with about 110,000 uh, pigs with sequence data, and it's, it's a massive amount of data. And they were imputed to about 20 million to 30 million SNPs, right? But then the question is, do we use all those 30 million SNPs? Well, not really. Uh, we don't use those 30 million SNPs because 30 million is too many SNPs to use. And also because most of the SNPs, they are redundant. They are not giving uh, extra information. And also if we use those SNPs, those 30 million SNPs in the evaluation system, uh, we will have some errors that when those errors accumulate, because we have a lot of SNPs, we are going to see, in fact, a decreasing accuracy instead of an increasing accuracy. So what we do instead, we need to try to mine SNPs that may be more significant. So, and what do I what do I mean by mining SNPs? So this is just like using some uh, statistical methods to try to see which SNPs are related to the traits of interest. So this is like uh, just trying to, we need to, to kind of ask those SNPs. So we ask SNP by SNP if uh, they are uh, just related to the trait. It's like trying to see if there are SNPs holding flags or holding signs saying the gene is here or the genes around here. This is in a nutshell, just to keep the things very simple. 
And then when we use those statistical methods, this is what we see. So, and this we call Manhattan plot. So uh, this is based on GWAS. So uh, one of the speakers before talked about GWAS. So this is what we call GWAS, right? This statistical method. So uh, this example here, this picture that I'm showing, it's not from sequence data, it's from regular 50K SNP chips, but it serves for the purpose because I just wanna show how it works. So we have here uh, each chromosome in the Y, uh, in the XX, sorry, each chromosome, just, um, um, and they, they are represented by different colors here, right? And then in the y-axis, we have the significance level. And in this case here, we have a Manhattan plot for birth weight in Angus. So we are trying to identify the SNPs that are related or SNPs, SNPs that can give a lot of information about birth weight in Angus. So each SNP is represented by one dot here. So let's say that we declare that the significance level is like 5.9 in this case. So the SNPs that are above this line, this red line, are the ones that we're going to say, okay, those are the SNPs that give a lot of information about birth weight. So they are the causative SNPs. We can call them causative SNPs or we can call them selected SNPs. But we can be less uh, strict as well and just say, okay, let's declare the SNPs that are uh, significant, the ones that are above this uh, black line here, which is in 2.2. So in this case, we're going to see more SNPs that are related to the trait. But the thing is, when we, are, we try to use some methods to try to identify which SNPs uh, have more effect on the trait, we have some issues here. And the effectiveness of those methods, they depend on several things. So one thing is the effective population size, which is the number of males and females that are breeding in the population. And it also depends on the number of animals that have sequence information and also phenotypes. So if we have large data, so large amounts of genotyped animals or sequenced animals and phenotypes, we are more confident in finding those causative SNPs. But if we have a small data, it's much more difficult to find or to identify those causative SNPs. And also this process is more susceptible to errors. So this is the problem. And just to illustrate what I'm talking about. So this is uh, an example here of uh, a study that uh, Ivan Poklinik did when he was doing his PhD in Georgia, so up to last year. So in this case, we investigated the effect of uh, population size. So um, how a population size would impact the ability of SNPs to find real genes. So here we have results just for one chromosome and then in the y-axis we have SNP effect. So here we simulated 10 genes of equal effect. So we had simulated data, we've simulated data is very easy because we can just say okay we have uh, 10 genes or we have 100 genes. So in this case we had 10 genes so represented here by the red dots, right? And then we used, for each chromosome, we used 500 SNPs to try to trace those genes. And then you can see here, uh, for the second gene, we could see one SNP that did a pretty good job. So we could see almost one-to-one -one correspondence here. But in some cases, like in this case here, uh, we could not see any SNP uh, tracing the gene. So we could not uh, identify this gene here. So this picture here shows us that trying to find genes may not be so easy as we may think it is, right? So if we had a successful search in this case, we should be able to see one green dot close to each red dot, but this unfortunately was not the case. And we can also see this data in a different way, in a slightly different way. So if we just average the SNP effects across all chromosomes, we can see the distribution. So we can see how the SNP effect is distributed across uh, the genes. So in this case here, we had a population with effective size of 60, and we used 6,000 animals with genotypes and phenotypes. And we could see here one SNP that had an effect of about 2.8, but in this case, the gene effect was four. So we could see it's, it's almost there, right? And then we decided to genotype and phenotype more animals. So instead of 6,000, we had 18,000. And in this case, we had a better power to detect uh, the gene, to try to find the gene. So because we can see here that there is one SNP, that has an effect of about uh, 
And if we say, okay, the threshold to detect or to, to determine which SNPs are significant is three, we may uh, lose this SNP here. We are not going to select this one, but we are going to select this one in a larger population. So if we have a larger population, we may be able to do a better job uh, trying to find which ones are the causative SNPs. And uh, so we, we don't have just a problem with small data. So I showed you before that if we have small data, we don't have enough power to actually figure out or to discover which SNPs are truly causative. So this is very important, population size and also effective population size, as I showed you before. But the method that we use to try to identify those causative SNPs is also important. So here we had three Manhattan plots, and this study uh, it was done by a PhD visitor from Italy that came to UGA. He stayed with us. He's still here, but uh, he will stay with us for almost one year. So his name is Enrico Mancin. So in this case, he investigated the impact of um, methods. So methods to try to find uh, qualitative SNPs. So the first one that he used was the classical jewel. So in this classical jewels, it does not account for population structure. And then we had here Emacs and single step jewels that account for population structure. And then here uh, in red, we can see the simulated genes. So the genes that he simulated and a stronger color means a larger effect. And if we use the classical GWAS here, um, just another point here, this uh, blue line uh, is the line to determine which SNPs are significant. So which SNPs are affecting the trait. So here we can see uh, a lot of SNPs that, uh, that were declared significant, although some of them or most of them were not even closer to SNPs. And this was using also a small population. But then when we used Emacs or single step jewels, we could see here that some genes were um, correctly uh, traced by uh, SNPs, but still some genes were not able. So we were not able to find some of the genes. So again, for the second time, this shows us that uh, trying to find genes uh, may not be so easy, right? So by knowing that trying to find genes may not be so easy, now I just want to shift to uh, some results using real uh, data. So we have some results on beef cattle and dairy cattle uh, when we selected SNPs from sequence data and use those SNPs to try to see how much increasing accuracy we could get. So the first example that I'm going to show you is a study done by my PhD student, Sambong Young. So Sambong did this study or may, uh, the main portion of this study when he was doing his master's uh, back in South Korea. So he used data from Hanu beef cattle. Uh, so Hanu is, uh, can be compared to Wagyu uh, because it has a very high marbling. So in this case here, um, Sambong used data from over 500,000 marbling score records. In the pedigree, there are about 1.3 million animals. And from those animals, uh, 1,160 were genotyped. So they just had regular SNP chips or they had 50,000 SNPs or 707, uh, 777,000 SNPs. And then some of those animals were sequenced and then they were imputed to sequence. And so all those 1,160 animals were imputed to 11 million SNPs. And then after the imputation, um, what they used some statistical methods to try to identify those causative SNPs, and they could identify about 331,000 SNPs. And then uh, they use that for genomic predictions. So they use just regular SNP chip and they also use those selected uh, sequence SNPs or the causative SNPs in the evaluation. And then here is uh, what he got. So we have results from base R, GBLUP, and also from single step GBLUP. So the first uh, result here in blue, we have uh, accuracies when they used 50,000 SNPs just a regular SNP chip. And then in red, we have when they use the selected SNPs from sequence data. And we could see here that the accuracy was even lower than before than using just the regular SNP chips. 
And then in green, when they combine the 50,000 SNP chip and also the selected SNP. So we could see that the accuracy was restored to the same level as before with the 50,000 uh, SNP chip. But still, uh, in this case, we did not see a gain in accuracy. And why is that? Well, there are some reasons here. First, this data is small. What I mean by small is that we have um, a small number of animals with sequence information, just like less than 1,200. And also in this case, those animals were used to try to select the, the causative variant. So we had a small set to select the causative variants. And because of that, possibly those variants that we are calling causative, they are not actually causative, right? And then if you are wondering why the accuracies from base R and G blood are lower than single step, and this is basically because in the first two methods, uh, they could just use 1,200 records, but in single step, they could use all records available. So another example that I wanna show here is with a larger data set. So this uh, study was uh, not done at UGA, so it was done by uh, Paul Van Raden from USDA. So uh, they had uh, sequence information for about 27,000 US hosting bulls. So um, some of them were sequenced and then it, this information was imputed to 27,000. And then based on that, they used some statistical methods to select about 16,000 SNPs based on effect size uh, of 33 traits. So they selected the SNPs that had higher effect on about 33 traits. And then what they did, they compared just like using the 60,000 SNP chip and adding those 16,000 selected SNPs to the 60,000 SNP chip. And then what I'm showing here is just the gain in accuracy for 33 traits and also for the average. And here, uh, what I did, I just got the results uh, from their paper. So I did, um, I just got 60,000 plus the selected SNPs minus the accuracy for 60,000 SNP chips. So if the difference here is positive, it means that there was a gain in accuracy. And if it's negative, it means there is a loss in accuracy. But overall here, we could see uh, that the gain in accuracy uh, was there. So there was a gain in accuracy by using uh, those selected SNPs from sequence data. But this gain was small, so the gain was a little bit over 0.01 uh, on average. And for some traits, this gain was um, a little bit less than that. So for milk, fat, and protein, we saw a gain of less than 0.01 in accuracy. But for some traits, it was a little bit higher than that. So for a stature, we saw a gain of almost 0.03. And when Paul um, did this study, he used the method called base A. Uh, that does not consider all the information in the system. So we wanted to test a uh, single step with this uh, exactly the same data. So we asked Paul to send us the data. He sent the data. And then Breno Fragomeni, who is a, uh, he, he was a postdoc in our lab, he ran this study. So in this study here, um, we um, then tested again. Um, so how single step would perform when we use 60,000 SNPs and 60,000 SNPs plus the selected uh, variants, and this is in green. So when we use selected plus SNPs, uh, I'm showing here in green. And then, so, okay, when Paul uh, did his study by using base A, there was a small gain lower than 0.03. And when uh, we did this study at UGA, we did not see an increase in accuracy. And then the question becomes, so why do we have a small increase in accuracy or most of the times we don't have increasing accuracy. So why is that? Well, in fact, we don't know if those variants that we are calling causative variants are actually causative. And in real data, it's hard for us to figure out if those variants are really causative. It's almost like impossible, I would say, if we wanna know all the causative variants. Uh, but when we have simulated data, we can simulate the genes and we can see how the things look like. So Breno also did some simulation studies. So he had about 30,000 genotyped animals. The animals were genotyped for 60,000 SNPs. And then we assumed that this trait we were simulating was affected by 100 genes. And I'm calling here the genes also QTNs or quantitative trait nucleotide. 
And then what we did, we did genomic predictions using single step, only with SNPs, with SNPs plus the genes, and only with genes. And this is the accuracies that we got. So first accuracy is when we use just 60,000 SNPs, just a regular SNP chip, so 0.49. And then when we added here the 100 genes to the SNP set, but we did not give any information about the genes. Actually, we did not tell the evaluation system that those are, uh, were genes, actually. So when we did that, we saw an increase in accuracy. So accuracy jumped from 0.49 to 0.53, so a gain of 0.04. So, and this gain was very similar to the gain that we saw using real data, right? But then when we used those 60,000 SNPs and we added 100 QTNs and we told the system, okay, we know the proportion of variance that each gene is explaining. So we put the genes over there and we put the amount of variance they were explaining. And then in this case, we got accuracy of 0.99. So why we did not get accuracy of 0.99? So this was 0.89. Why we did not get accuracy of 0.99? Well, this is because we had SNPs and we had genes. So we had to split the information from the genes with the SNPs as well. They were kind of stealing some information. And then when we use just the 100 genes to run our genomic evaluation, we saw an accuracy of 0.99. So this is perfect accuracy, right? But the thing here is the assumption that we made was pretty strong. So we assumed that we knew all the genes. But in fact, we don't know all the genes. So let's say that we assume that we know just 10% of the genes. So in this case, we are going to see an increase in accuracy, but we are not going to see a full increase. We're just going to see a percentage of this increase. And another thing that we did in this study as well, uh, oh, sorry. Another thing that we did in this study as well, we said, okay, so when we have 6,000 SNPs plus the 100 genes, so let's put the weight for the, the gene. And then when we did that, the accuracy was maximized. And then we said, okay, instead of putting the, the, the weight or the variance for this uh, gene, let's move the weight a little bit further, just pretending we didn't know the exact position of the gene here. So when we did that, when we moved the, the variance or the weight uh, to the first neighbor, second neighbor, up to neighbor 27, we saw here that accuracy decreased. So what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that if we want to maximize accuracy of genomic predictions, we need to know all the genes, we need to know all the variants that they explain, and we need to know the exact position for those genes, for all of them. And then usually when I show this slide, I always joke that I will be glad to come back in 2050 to discuss more about those genes, to talk um, a little bit more about those genes. But recently I figured out that it may take 100 years or 200 years for us to, to have information about all or the most or, or like a great pro proportion of the genes uh, affecting traits of interest. So based on everything that I showed you here today, the final question of my presentation is, so is it really possible to increase accuracy of genomic EPDs with sequence data in real cattle populations? Well, I have several answers for that. One of uh, the answers is, okay, um, it's possible. And it's possible if we uh, get to know SNPs closely related to genes, or if we know SNPs that turn genes on and off, or also if we know the amount of information that those genes are giving. The downside here is that we don't know all the genes. And also, if we know just a little bit of the genes, we are going to have just a little bit of increase in accuracy. So what I'm trying to tell here is that what we need to do, we need to try to find a way to squeeze the, the information out of sequence data in a way that this information that we get is non-redundant with the information that is already in the SNP chip. So what we need, we just need to find a way to identify where is the information that is non-redundant to the one that is already in the SNP chip. And what I can tell you 
is that there, there are lots of studies right now on trying to, uh, or a lot of projects trying to uh, sequence animals and trying to understand uh, if we are going to be able to get some information and if this information is going to be useful for us in uh, genomic predictions. So um, my opinion about that, so uh, why we have a lot of studies on that, this is because the animal breeding genetics community is always trying to find the best models, the best methods, and the best source of information that will help us to increase accuracy of EPDs. And because of that, it's going to help us to increase genetic gain. So uh, the, the point here is, is we are working with research, right? So uh, research may have positive uh, outcome or may have negative income. So the, the, uh, the thing, he, uh, or outcome, sorry, it may have positive outcome or a negative outcome, right? But I think we always need to hope for the best and we always need to try to exhaust our, all possibilities. So, and if we find something that is really useful, we adopt that. And if not, we are just going to move forward and try to see what else we can do to help us to increase accuracy of EPDs. So with that, I think I'm, I'm already out of time here. It's over seven. So I just uh, would like to thank you for your attention and thank you for being here with me like so late. Mark? Daniela, thank you so much. I think Mark's still on. Yes, I am. Sorry, okay, I was just uh, trying to figure out how to advance to this last slide. So uh, we do have a question and I think it's for Daniela. Uh, it is by using genomic testing and AI to select for a handful of economically important traits, do we run the risk of narrowing the genetic diversity of our cattle populations, leaving them more vulnerable to unanticipated environmental challenges, whether it be a disease or the effects of climate change? What I see is that uh, there's always have to be a balance. That's why we have selection indexes, right? So we, we put a little bit here, we put a little bit there. And what is interesting is that we are always going back and trying to see if we are losing something. And if we are losing, we try to correct for that. So um, in my opinion, I don't see that that is going to happen uh, very soon. So I think we have been able to try to manage that very well. And so if we uh, estimate like variance components based on uh, data like 15 years ago or, or now, we don't see a big change in variance. So this means that we are kind of uh, doing a pretty reasonable job in trying to uh, keep that. So this is just my opinion. Probably the, the previous speakers, they have something to tell about that as well. Uh, yeah, well, I guess I'll chime in. I think it's a risk when we um, have things such as, let's say, disease or environmental adaptability that we're not measuring and including inner selection indices. And I think the gist of the question is that, um, that we reduce genetic variation by using genomic testing in concert with AI. And, and I think certainly that there is a risk of that. Um, but, but the other side of that is to avoid all that risk, we make no progress. And, and so I think it's better to make progress and accept the risk and to always be looking out for what are the unanticipated consequences. And if we see them coming, then we may have to start measuring and including uh, additional traits that we did not have on our radar before. What do you think about that, Danielle? Yeah, so I think, um, uh, sorry, I, I, was, I was reading another question here. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't get that. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. I think if we if if everyone has the same objective and we're all using AI, then we run that risk. If we have the diverse objectives, and that's less likely to get us so you know so narrow that we're not going to have any diversity.
Okay, and then we have a, another question. Besides the advantages of genomic information, e.g. generation interval and accuracy, a decreasing of additive genetic variation was also observed after genomic prediction implementation, which is not desirable in animal breeding. Am I right? If so, what are your thoughts on how to apply genomic selection aiming either achieving great genetic gain and controlling additive genetic variation? What would be a suggested approach to control that? So I think this uh, question is linked to the previous question, uh, kind of, right? So I think uh, maybe so. Hmm? I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it's kind of linked to the previous question, right? But uh, there are always uh, ways to try to, to balance that. As I said before, uh, one way is to uh, probably, because the genetic gain is not just based on selection, but there is the mating component as well. We can try to balance that with mating as well. And we can always uh, try to see or try to, to investigate what's happening with uh, genetic variants in this case. And then if we see some change, we go back and try to change something in the system. Okay, and then another question is, having highlighted the disadvantages of SNPs, why don't we pursue only sequencing data, having been sifted for non-causal sequences, et cetera, et cetera, assuming it's affordable? Mm -hmm. So um, the way that I see that is, uh, okay, if we think about like using all the sequence data, 30 million SNPs, I think uh, there is kind of a computational, uh, it's not limitation, but it's a challenge for us to do that. But if we think about just like uh, selecting some SNPs and using those SNPs out of sequence data or sequencing, or just like looking at those SNPs, uh, like that would be like less than 1 million SNPs or something like that, this would be feasible. And uh, maybe Mark can comment on that based on uh, what your experience is on GenCo, because we can see that we can have um, high imputation accuracy, right? So it's possible to have this information for uh, like hundreds of thousands of animals, but it doesn't mean, as I, as I uh, told you before, it doesn't mean that we're going to use the 30 million SNPs, we need to narrow down. And then um, I think based on that, we, we, can, we can move forward to evaluation. If we have like up to uh, 1 million SNPs, probably we are not going to overwhelm the evaluation system. But then we need to see if this is really beneficial or not. Yeah, so I think it's, it, it comes back to the P much greater than N problem. That, that if we've got 30 million SNPs to sort through, um, if we have 100 million animals, we're maybe in pretty good shape. But if we've got less than a million animals, then, then it's going to be difficult, as, as Daniela showed, to identify what really are the causal uh, SNPs. And we have to, uh, so, so we're not going to be able to get them identified all that accurately, but we can make improvements in prediction without knowing exactly which ones are the causal SNPs. And so it's, it's a challenging problem, but I think it's one that we can uh, make progress on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, just to add to that and to, to reinforce that, that uh, one very difficult task is to try to identify the SNPs that are associated with the trait. If we have like large data sets, uh, large, large, like based on what um, uh, Mark said, the uh, NP problem. So in this case, we may have some problems with the methods that we have right now to try to identify those uh, SNPs that are really giving extra information. Yeah, so, so I think this kind of identifies what the challenge is going forward. Um, you know, the low pass looks really promising in terms of being able to impute sequence in an efficient and cost effective way. Uh, we haven't really had access to that level of information in general for so far. And so there's an awful lot that we're going to learn going forward. Mm -hmm. And 
Is anyone else seeing questions? I believe that's all that I'm seeing. Yep. Uh, just uh, one just showed up, uh, Mark, in the uh, in the chat box yeah, here. Yeah, I just saw that. So the reduced size of the Brahmin population would be a challenge. What suggestions to bypass that and still improve the breed? When you say the reduced size of the Brahman population, actually I have no idea about the effective size in Brahman. Do you have an idea, Mark? Uh, my, my suspicion is that there's a fair bit of diversity there. I'm, I'm not sure that's exactly what was being asked. Maybe the question is that uh, because it's a uh, smaller breed, there would not be as many animals genotyped. Mm -hmm. um, and that is always a challenge when we're, when we're dealing with a smaller breed. And the hope would be that with sequence data that we would be able to finally begin to share information between breeds which has proven to be very challenging to do with the uh, SNP chips. But uh, the thought is that when we get to the level of sequence data, that it should be more e effective to combine data across breeds. And uh, actually doing that may help to be another source of information to narrow down which, um, which variants are the, the most promising. Uh, but Brahmin is going to be the most difficult, or any boss indicus is going to be a lot more difficult to, um, to, to try to share information from boss Taurus. It, it's just not going to work as well when we, when we go across uh, groups that are that um, distantly related. Mm -hmm. So within boss Taurus, I think there's some opportunity there. It's going to be more challenging with Brahmin. Um, so, you know, what suggestions to bypass that and still improve the breed? Uh, keep doing what you're doing or genotype an awful lot of animals. And can I add something on that? Because uh, based on my experience, we have seen that we have a considerable increase in accuracy of EPDs or genomic EPDs, when we have more genotyped animals than the number of effective chromosome segments, which is dependent on the, the effective population size. So in this case, when we have more genotyped animals than the number of independent chromosome segments, we are better able to estimate SNP effects so we can do that more accurately. So this is, this is one of the limitations. So if we have few genotyped animals, we may see a small gain in accuracy. And then Mark pointed out, and this is, this is one of the things that we are going to try to investigate in the pig sequence uh, data project, is if we can find SNPs that are equally informative in different breeds, because we have several breeds that are genotyped in the pig data set. So we will try to see if we can find those SNPs, or if those SNPs, they are uh, equally informative uh, across breeds, we may be able to get uh, SNPs from one breed and predict in another breed. So this may also help small breeds. So this is one of the hopes. Mark, if I, if I may, I, I think one other important point, particularly for a breed that may have uh, fewer animals, is to take advantage of, of phenotypic recording density. So it becomes a bit wasteful if you have a lot of genotyped animals that don't have many phenotypes. So I, obviously all breeds, but particularly those that perhaps are smaller need to ensure first that um, phenotypic data recording is as dense as possible, or, or I think the latter's moot. Thank you for um, contributing that, Matt. That's an excellent point. Yeah, yeah, genotypes without phenotypes don't get us very far. Yeah, genotypes cannot do anything without phenotypes. And, and so then we have another question. Can't germplasm be conserved from past generations in the National Germplasm Conservancy to overcome the problem discussed in a previous question? And I think that's the one about uh, 
the increase in inbreeding that comes along with with uh, genomic prediction and AI, um, and and I think certainly uh, we, we shouldn't lose genomic resources, but we can get into an issue where the where a large portion of the industry population is fairly concentrated, and if it goes off in the wrong direction and we don't keep track of it and, and head off problems, then, then we do have some risk. Did you want to address that, Danielle? Yeah, so um, I, I, I don't know, but my concern with that, so let's say that we have uh, germoplasm for, uh, from previous generations, right? So, uh, and then let's say that we are going to uh, like create an animal based on that and introduce the animal in the population. So the, genet the genetic level may be a little bit below than what we are right now. So this is kind of my concern on that, but I, I may be totally uh, uh, wrong on that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, a, a very valid concern. Uh, the, the issue is that we can be, uh, as the, the question brought up, we can be selecting for things that we think are making animals more productive. And if we're not paying attention, we can have unintended consequences from that. And one of the uh, presentations yesterday pointed out that generally selecting for productivity has an adverse effect on general disease resistance. And we had a presentation earlier today on the uh, brisket disease. And we don't really know whether the high elevation is the same as what's happening in the, uh, in the feedlot cattle. But it seems that that there what's happening is that the most, that the really high growth, really productive cattle that seem to be doing everything really well have maybe been selected for slightly smaller organ sizes. And then when we um, grow them out at 3000 feet elevation, if everything goes well, it, 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 everything works out well, but you put them under a little bit of stress and they get right to the end of the feeding period and and they just uh, overload their hearts and, and end up dying right at the end. And there have been examples of those sorts of things happening in other species as well. So I, I think that's the gist of the question. It's not something I lose a lot of sleep over, but I think it is a legitimate question. Any other thoughts on, on that? And did I miss any other questions? Well, seeing none, thank you so much, Daniela, for sharing that with us. Uh, we always appreciate your contributions.
of Iowa and Iowa State University are proud to host the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. The convention will be located in downtown Des Moines with easy access to the airport, hotels, and local restaurants. Iowa State University is just north with its research and teaching farms. Join us in Iowa and experience how Iowa provides the beef industry with innovation to application. <laughs>